Olá. Boa tarde. Sejam Hello, todos. Everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome for, to our fourth session of our international meeting on popular education and citizenship experiences and challenges. If you're here on our Zoom meeting as a monitor, as a speaker, as a collaborator, be very welcome. If you're watching us through our many channels on our social networks, afternoon as well. Good afternoon. I am Rosani Bertotti. I am the National Secretary of the Training of the Unified Workers Central. I'm white. And in this moment, uh, my hair is tied up with a present that I received from the indigenous women from Amazonas. I am an agriculture and I have the responsibility of mediating this conversation this afternoon. I want to say to you that this meeting aims to understand all continents and the different ways of communications and languages. And we're going to have interpretation in English, Portuguese and Spanish. So if you don't understand Portuguese or if you want to listen to the seminar in another language, you need to go to the website and you have the interpretation icon and you can choose the channel in which you want to hear the event and we are having the collaboration of the catholic university of rio de janeiro through professor rafaela and the students that are contributing to provide this translation the struggle of education and new technologies is something that is an issue of the whole world and is a great challenge to construct this together. So let me begin and I'll try to speak in a paused way so to contribute with the translation so that everyone can comprehend and translate efficiently. We also have uh, people in the monitoring of the event, they are contributing to us and we are very thankful for their participation. And I want to say that this activity is transmitted in the Video Saudi channel from Fio Cruz. And this event was organized by many collectives, many organizations throughout um, a lot of months and a lot of years since 2019 and also the Unified Workers Central has joined in especially through the Rio de Janeiro's base through Beth and Jairo's aid they've been also together and Marcelinho uh, with all the meetings and many other collectives. The first idea that we started in 2019, then we went to 2020 and with the pandemic, our lives changed, our realities changed. So we decided to organize this meeting, even if it's through the virtual modes and we also joined in the celebration of the 100 years uh, of Paulo Freire. He was an educator that talked for the people, by the people, and he was a man who was a visionary and he saw education of letters is an education of a view of the world. So that made people move and seek transformation of their world. And it's in this way that we see that changes started to happen. This meeting started on August 6th and will end on October 4th. We had more than 200 uh, workshops, 
hundreds of people have participated in simultaneous workshops that are happening throughout all of these days. So if you still want to be a part of this, this is our third plenary session. These sessions are always from 2 to 4 p.m. When and also we have in the mornings our thematic sessions and we also have our artistic viewings that always happen from noon to 2 p.m. and then in the evening at 8 p.m. because we know that art is a part of education and transformation for all of us. And also at 4, we also have workshops that are thematic workshops. And the topic of this session is a very challenging one. We are looking at challenges in popular education and we see that popular education is looking people in the eyes and being close to people and seeing people in a holistic way. So the topic that we'll be sharing about is popular education, new technologies and new languages. It's clear that this topic of new technologies and transformation has been through the time being a part of the debate of the struggle in popular education. The pandemic just heightened this and shown that the debate of popular education and new technologies is not something that came with the pandemic and will pass. It's something that is rooted in our daily lives. And we cannot think about popular education and challenges and not understand new technologies and see how that happens through new technologies and how new technologies are can be of service to popular education. And if we believe together with Paulo Freire of the importance of popular education, how can we transform popular education through screens, through the new technologies? How can we comprehend the new realities of popular education? Knowing that sometimes people that seek popular education are people who need it the most. And people who need it the most are the ones who have the most struggle to have access to new technologies. So if we think about methodologies of inclusion and learning, how can get, we can guarantee access? How can we guarantee a coverage? How can we think of the new challenges of this transformation and of new technologies? And if we think through Paulus Freire's eyes that education is not only education, it's transformation, is inclusion, is the place where people meet and become individuals of themselves and of the world. So we have many challenges. And today we have three women and with me four and will contribute to this debate. And of course, together with you, because throughout our conversation, you can share something through the chat. So we have Daniela Musi, we have Lisa Thompson and Regina Marletello that will contribute to this debate. And they are not only women, because you don't only need to be a woman, you have to take a stand and contribute to transformation. And this is what enriches in this conversation, in this intervention that we're gonna have in this wonderful afternoon. And I'm so proud as a rural, a farmer worker coming from the south of Brazil to understand the role and the importance of education in the transformation of people and to understand the role of education in the lives of workers to understand the role and the organization of social movements in the dealing with 
education as a transformation for the world and to understand the difficult moment that Brazil lives where education has been set aside, science has been set aside, social movements are disrespected, and we see every day this disregard for a workers training, and we need to see all of these issues together to contribute to our struggle and in the fight for social transformation in our country. Because as Paulus Freire says in his book, the humans are born by themselves in an anthological way and they're always hopeful. And yes, men and women, we are born hopeful, but not in a hope of waiting but in a hope of doing in a personal hope of dreaming and make things happen and building things and uh i would like to also uh, invite my fellow professors and colleagues to share because i always say that the role of the academia in this process of construction is fundamental. The integration between social movement and academia is paramount. We in the Unified Workers Central are always together with the academic fields, and especially for us Brazilians and I could say also for Latin America and everyone that defends a just society and an equal society. So without further ado, I would like to invite to as our first speaker, and I would like to say that everyone will have around 20 to 25 minutes. So I would like to invite Daniela Musi. She's the professor of the Rio Philosophy and Social Science students and coordinator of Emancipa University. Thank you so much, Daniela. Thank you for to everyone that is contributing to this event. So I give you the floor. You have 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Rosani. I thank you so much for the invitation. It's so nice to join you in this plenary session. Um, talking about language and technologies, I'd like to um, congratulate all institutions that are working for popular education. I'm very honored to participate on this, in this debate. I have prepared a presentation that I want to share with you today. And and this presentation, I'm thinking about this topic that was proposed. Um, well, I'm presenting my ethnical identity. I'm a white woman, woman from a Arabic ancestrality. I am, and also talking for those ones who can't see me, I have black eye black eyes, black hair, and I'm wearing blue clothes. So this is a trans, um, translation of uh, my appearance to those who are blind. So I have presented something to present new and old technologies and language and I'm talking from the standpoint of Hedge Emancipa, that's a social movement. We work in the periphery, per peripheral areas in Rio de Janeiro. And we work with uh, education in prisons, education of youth and adults. We also have uh, anti racist projects. And inside of this, project, I coordinate a course on that involves universities in the city of Rio de Janeiro. For those who don't know, 
our work, we work and with communication between university and those one who want to access the universities. We also work with uh, public education in other spaces that are not um, schools. But for me, it's important to highlight that we have um, social media as an important tool to talk with uh, teenagers, with the youth, because those are the ones who are the ones who most use um, social network. So image is very important for communication with that group. And we've been working with uh, social media even before the pandemic started. We work with YouTube, Instagram, and other social media. So you can see that our work with the uh, internet and online communication is not new. And slowly we started to post on social media what is the reality in the country. Sometime before the pandemic, we have expanded during the pandemic when there was an expansion of social media. It was clear for us that we needed to uh, connect to the different regions of the country. We can post a thing from different states, so different states would know what's going on in other parts of the country. And it's also to know, important to know what's going on inside the different universities across the country, different, uh, different church, um, Popular, uh, work with popular education. Therefore, in Rede Emancipa, our social movement, we have a long work. I want to talk much more about it, but I just want to comment that digital uh, technology allowed us to have this type of um, interaction among the ones who work in the project and they could even know the difference regional difference among different people who work with us and in every case every region we have a different culture and it was also impulse also important to its strength the interaction between us and also on grounding the information that we always had and also and it was also possible for us to know what was going on in daily life through images and when we collected those images of daily lives and of those one who work in the projects and post on social media, everyone could access and know what was going on in different parts of the country. So you can see photos here from the opening classes. And we also have photos here of a demonstration in one of our most famous university and the and it was exactly in the Federal University of Sao Paulo. And when we, when people who are from the private area, they went to this traditional university and they started occupying this university, we see that they were discovering that they could occupy a space that was completely strange to them because the, as they are from a deprived area and they are having access to a different area, I think it's an important moment. And I also believe 
that it would not possible to do all this work and to reach out so many people if it was not using technology, new technologies, because through technologies we could spread those images and so everyone could know our work. Another work we have here, and it is the last photo, we also have a demonstration on a public, in a public space. And about this last photo, this was an opening class we organized in 2018 in Sao Paulo. And it was an um, opening class for students of a low income. And it was a very, a very important class because the videos and images that we transmitted from here, they were shown all across the countries and many popular courses and schools who work with popular education could um, see what we were doing and somehow it communicates, it sends a messages, a message to um, other projects. And here we don't, we not only have students, we also have their families participating in this project. And it was also possible that, and it was very important because there was no selection process for these courses. So this was a very important day. And this was also a day that we talked about a lot of things. And this opening class happened just a few moments, uh, just maybe two weeks before the assassination of Marielle Franco. And I don't remember the exact date. And that was why we didn't mention it, because it was just a few moments. And after the assassination of Marielle, Emancipa's changed its logo. Maybe you can't see it because it's very small. And we had uh, the word Emancipa, and in the letter I, we had a student with its hand raised. And after Marielle's assassination, we changed the our logo, and now Marielle's image is on our logo. And that was part of a visual campaign to start to raise awareness of showing images as part of a construction of showing our identity. So here we have a lot of what we do in the Emancipa University. The Emancipa University started as classes in the outskirts of society or in favelas, and then it started to become an in-person course in the Maria Antonia building in the Sao Paulo University. And after it, it became a series of classes in a more systematic way in the society, especially in the context of the second round of the elections in 2018. And social media was decisive because in the days that we had classes for Emancipa, we also had a communication campaign so we could register that in that day we were occupying Brazilian cities to discuss an emerging topic. So this energy, this popular energy, this political energy, creative energy was not dissipated, it wasn't lost maybe in a perception that it was only happening in my neighborhood or in my school. So social media helped us to produce this uh, view of a movement without us having to abandon that specific territory that brings us to another side of the situation because sometimes we think, oh, let's do this act or let's do this class in a central area, but this central area is not 
actually central to our youth and to our students the center of life and possibility and identity is in their own neighborhoods in their own communities so instead of fragmentating the visibility of the actions are producing something that's merely central as we had some classes in a specific location but we spread this discussion to many other physical areas so we combine the use of networks and the local construction and that was extremely important so that we could have in 2019 in that struggle against the setbacks in education and the emancipa network had if you have and we had a role in helping to helping to be part of that struggle so that was 2019 and we started to do the, a lot of classes because we wanted to bring it to the masses and we wanted to have a media coverage. And we started to think about what we could do for the people as a whole. Uh, there were a lot of people in the academic area, researchers, people uh, that were integrated in research that were available to talk about their experience in public universities and their relationship with science. And that allow us to create this series of public classes. And we started to enroll uh, volunteers, educators that could work as volunteers. And this is also an example of an event of related to the environment struggle and then we started to think about how can we connect with science that were in the environmental movement and we started to just try to just disrupt this bubble of people who are always uh, talking about this struggle because it's a very interesting topic, the environmental topic, but it was very difficult to relate to the peripheric regions and those conversations were already happening in the, the peripheries, but they were in connecting and they were talking about uh, the struggle with health issues and sanitation. And if we talk about the periphery, we talk about the struggle of people who cannot even use the soil to use it for their farms anymore. And they have to then move out to cities. And then the struggle that unified us was very interesting and that was a very deciding movement and that became the construction of an alliance for human rights and Emancipa still has uh, organic participation with the struggle of human rights and we have a struggle specifically with uh, nine young uh, youth that died through um, the policies, uh, the police action, and we are connecting with lawyers and human rights advocates and the youth and also the Emancipa Network advocates. And this event is still happening, this movement is still happening. And our idea is that we can through this movement, create new laws. And the families are talking about this as well. And we want to try to have the families engaged with policies and making policies. So we need to listen to families and bring specialists to facilitate this dialogue 
And it's very important, this feeling that there is not just one place where things happen, but every place is important for transformation. So we are trying to build things in person and also through the digital medias. So here we also have a politic, a policy that we're trying to bring our courses to the international uh, space. Be and we started to talk to with the social, uh, so Sao Paulo University to try to reach immigrants that are in the outskirts of society and they need uh, to learn Portuguese, for example, so they can uh, achieve their rights. So they need help for, let's say, a language test. And the university has that knowledge of the language so why not try to have this in connection but that was just at, before the pandemic and before the pandemics we had the idea of having courses of portuguese as a language of welcoming so someone as an immigrant that don't understand the other language the other classes they can start with a portuguese class so that was what was at least important for us as this uh welcoming stage but because of the pandemic we weren't able to do that because we couldn't have any more in-person activities and that made us suffer a lot but this democratization of learning became an active movement to support indigenous and immigrant families. And if you look at the picture on the center, we have a group of people who also came together to combat hunger. And then now we see our actions throughout the pandemic. We had a place that was able to integrate and massify our, our speeches so our first image through the left it was a class that we had to cancel and it was going to happen here in sao paulo we are organizing through emancipa uh, network uh, over 17 classes and they were going to help happen simultaneously throughout the community and throughout favelas and the outskirts and we also uh, were trying to do that on the day of Marielle's assassination, the anniversary of the assassination, and we had to cancel everything. And we migrated all of our work and the pedagogic work that we were doing. So we had to migrate all of our actions to the internet and to YouTube. So our YouTube channel uh, pretty much was born because of the pandemic. It existed, but was very incipient before that. And Emancipa Network will never be grateful enough to public uh, universities as we are due to this pandemic. And we were able to build a strong alliance that allowed us to get together hundreds of people so we had the first course that was about the pandemic and it was historical because we were able to gather in the course schedule to understand what was happening through the reflection of the outskirts and with the people from the outskirts and we brought together activists academics political leaderships that were rising through the pandemic and becoming a reference because of the pandemic. And so that was very important also in the political sense. And we also had a, a class that was a social structure as well. And we also had a partnership with two uh, universities from Rio de Janeiro. And we also had in 2020 a partnership with a university from Minas Gerais, another state here in Brazil. And we also had other uh, partnerships with 
different public universities from different states of Brazil. So here in the corner, we had uh, we had this picture of our course that had more than 10,000 people to enroll, over 18,000 actually. And when we were talking about public health, with all the know-how that the public health workers had, we created this pamphlet that we shared and that also allowed us to have complementary actions together with our course. And we also had uh, something that is going to end this week. And it was a course that is 100 years of Paulo Feire. And I know I have just a short amount of time. And all of these courses happened through YouTube and also using WhatsApp groups. There were our classes and we had dozens of moderators and coordinators. And now we are going to a new level or a new place with our relationship with the virtual that is the Emancipa Cinema. So we just started this and we only had three classes until now. And we have a partnership with the Rio's Federal University and also with our filmmakers in Emancipa Network. And we're doing the classes through YouTube and we have 3000 people enrolled and we have this course that people will put together their own movies and they will share through Instagram. So we're starting this movement through Instagram of people sharing their own movies and popular movies and it's throughout the whole country. So that's it. I think what I wanted is to start this exchange and share my experience of Emancipa with social networks. And even though social media and new technologies are new and we have the challenge of the pandemic that's bringing new challenges for us, I still think that this is an old combination. It's before the pandemic, using technologies to enhance our territory and give it visibility without denying uh, taking over the center, but also giving away to the outskirts to produce something. And I think the main challenge right now, as I conclude, for the Emancipa Network is to see how can we balance the way that digital media has brought us so that we can use it as a reconstructing tool for our new social ways. So that's, that's it. Uh, Daniela, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. And I thank you all who have been attending this um, plenary session. And today we are working with the topic uh, languages and new technologies. And now we've just heard um, Professor Daniela Musi, and um, she brought us uh, something about her experience with Emancipa. Um, social movement, and she told us how important it is to have um, digital media as a tool to involve more actors in the process uh, of uh, working with uh, popular education. And we can say that taking into consideration what she has uh, mentioned, either traditional education and new technologies are, all, are both important in the, in the process between the ones who want to work with popular education. And now, we are going to have with us Lisa 
Tom Professor Lisa Thompson. She is a professor of uh, Western Cape University. She is from the Institute of Philosophy, Social Science of the Federal University of the African Center for Citizenship and Democracy. Lisa, it's a pleasure to have you here with us in this afternoon. Thank you very much for the introduction, and I'm very pleased to be part of the panel, such a prestigious all-women panel. It's um, fantastic to have this engagement and debate. Um, thank you, Daniela, for your presentation. I learned a lot from it. Um, so I would like to start off by just sketching a little bit of the context of South African universities, because I assume that you're probably quite unfamiliar with how what our university system is structured and also the interface that was discussed um, by about the inter, 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 uh, um, um, intermeshing of uh, social movements and universities and how universities work towards assisting and capacitating social movements. So in the South African context, we obviously have a the vestiges of an apartheid education system, and that is very much still very prevalent in the way our university system is structured. So I quickly had a look to see how many universities you have in Brazil. I see it's a phenomenal 127 universities, whereas in South Africa, we have 26. So we have very large student numbers at most of the universities. And the university that I joined in 1995 uh, as a former member of the African National Congress is the uh, University of the Western Cape, and that is where the African Center for Citizenship and Democracy is located. The University of the Western Cape is one of the few universities in the country that uh, supports and directly engages with the, the poorest of the poor, and particularly in terms of both education within the university and popular education. So the university has a commitment to both of those uh, aspects of empowering citizens. So it's a very proud struggle history. We have many of our former uh, university professors went into government, including my former colleague at the, uh, the center used to be called the Center for South Southern African Studies. And my former colleague, uh, Professor Rob Davies became our Minister of um, uh, Trade and Industry for, for, for decades. And uh, so he went into government in order to, to effect transformation from within. So at our university, we do have this interface and the work that ACCEED does, along with other institutions on campus, is primarily actually towards popular education, towards assisting those uh, poorer communities to both capacitate them as well as also to assist them in uh, forming social movements. However, unlike Brazil, we have a very much weaker interface between academia and social movements on the one hand. And on the other hand, we also have a situation where even now during um, COVID, we have what well, even more now during COVID, we have a very fractured engagement between social movements themselves. So this creates a lot of issues. I mean, it creates a lot of issues within the university itself to start off with during COVID because as I think Daniela was mentioning in her presentation, many of these problems around um, how to now uh, both engage within the university context as well as engage with social movements is made a lot more problematic by COVID and by the huge reliance that we now have on, uh, on social media platforms. So my university, as I said, has a student body, most of whom come from very poor uh, families and very poor communities. 
2020 was a sharp learning curve for us within the university because another big issue that we faced is that South Africa has of the most expensive data in Africa. So most of our students, first of all, couldn't afford the data. Second of all, they, most of them didn't have computers. And so we had to have a, 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 a big push from central management, which I must say was done brilliantly, where, um, and I really have to commend, you know, my the whole senior management team at UWC for making sure that students were given free data. They could apply for free data. They could also apply for iPads. We were donated iPads so that they could just continue with, uh, with university as the new normal, which was like, I would say, the new abnormal. Um, and of course, we had lots of problems. In the first year, there were lots of students who, for one reason or another, didn't get data, were in a rural area where they couldn't, uh, where the data didn't work properly, so they couldn't actually participate in ordinary classes. Um, many of those issues, I'm happy to say we've trouble managed to troubleshoot. We extended our term so that students were able to do like a catch up at the end of the year. Um, so we only started our university system usually ends in December. This year we ran late and we only started our, our new semester in March in order to be able to cater for the disadvantaged students so that they could catch up. They had to make a effort so that they could be in the same place at the end of the semester. Sorry, I got feedback in. Uh, okay, uh, so um, I could just hear somebody else talking. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so that in our university context, that was a big issue. And then to give uh, two examples of interface, acad academic interface with, um, with social movements. Uh, we work uh, at the university, we work quite closely with environmental movements and we work quite cl closely also with labor, but <clears throat> Given that in South Africa, we have a very, very small percentage of, uh, of the poor or the working class that actually belong to trade unions. Only 10% of, of the working class belong to an organized trade union. So we have to work, and Exceed has done a lot of this, where we've worked with communities that are ununionized, and we've worked together with with uh, a number of other social movements, depending on what issue it's on, to try to capacitate and educate uh, communities so that they can uh, effectively participate in what South African, the South African government calls participatory development. Now, unfortunately, we have a large amount of policy and legislation on uh, participatory development. But in practice, a lot of participatory development is government wanting communities to say, this is sustainable, yes, go ahead. Uh, and basically it becomes what we call a tick box exercise because communities don't have the knowledge or the, the um, technical knowledge to be able to engage. And this of course has been made, this problem has been amplified by COVID where a lot of communication is done remotely. Um, and to give an example for, uh, from the work that we're doing now, which you, can, which you can find on the internet on our website at www.accede, that's A-C-C-E-D-E dot -E C-O dot Z-A. Um, or you can also Google um, uh, uh, Lisa Thompson, Mail and Guardian where we've written a lot in Mail and Guardian on what we've been doing. We've been working on a project which is um, in the Limpopo province. It's one of the largest development projects in South Africa. Um, and the environmental impact assessment on that project is going to be finalized in the next couple of weeks. This, this project forms part of um, China's expansion into South Africa, and it's also part of Belt and Road. And it all revolves around a, a dirty energy coal plant. So 
what we've had to do um, in, in coalition with groups like EarthLife, um, the Center for Environmental Rights, which is a, a group of an incredible group of progressive uh, um, environmental lawyers based here in Cape Town, um, and amongst others, we've had to form a coalition to try to, to capacitate communities to understand what's at stake with this environmental impact assessment. And this has, of course, been all made much more difficult because of COVID. So these communities are rural communities. And to try to get to engage with them via platforms like Zoom is um, impossible. Most of them don't have computers. Uh, most of them don't have knowledge of, of the technology. And so we've, we've actually had to lobby and, and pressure government to ensure that during our various lockdowns that, that they have face-to-face -face engagements with these communities. And in between, we've worked on platforms like yourselves, like WhatsApp, um, YouTube, um, uh, particularly those two, to get information to the communities on what is happening so that they are able to engage, that they're able to understand what's at stake for them when government, for example, comes and says, we are going to provide you with 53,800 jobs for locals who haven't been skilled at all for a zone that is, is a metallurgical extractive zone um, where the chances of these uh, communities getting jobs are very, very low. So that's just one example. I mean, another example where we have worked together with, um, well, internationally as well, would be on, on BRICS with working to, to together with BRICS countries and also with uh, uh, um, academics and activists working around um, the Forum on China and Africa Cooperation, where we've done a lot of uh, um, uh, critique um, of what is happening and of what, what the issues are. Again, to inform communities, to make sure that they understand what is at stake, but also to capacitate them in order for them to be able to involve, be involved and also for them to be able to to um, mobilize. So in 2018, when we had the BRICS Summit here in South Africa um, organized, um, and uh, here, um, Anna Garcia, who's now with, uh, with the BRICS Policy Center, she's been involved in various um, parts of this mobilization. Um, a very um, a good colleague of mine based right there in Rio. Um, she's been involved in this uh, BRICS from below as well as People's BRICS. But we have found that, um, that the appetite and the capacity for universities in South Africa to engage in this kind of activist or action-based work isn't very high. Um, and that is also, again, a legacy of the apartheid structuring of our university system, where we have what, you know, would be internationally understood as the, the, sort of the historically white Ivy League universities that are now much more multiracial, but that retain uh, more of a kind of uh, uh, neoliberal stance uh, towards education, not as much outreach, not as much interest in engaging with um, social movements. And so um, I don't want to particularly name and shame any of these universities, but it's well known that there are the, the universities that were started during the apartheid years, which were um, segregated. So we had historically white universities and we had historically um, black universities, of which UWC is one of them. It's obviously become more, more multiracial post-apartheid. But to a large extent, it is the universities who come from that struggle history that have more of an engagement with um, social movements. So unfortunately, uh, I have to end on the note of saying, in terms of the integration of uh, uh, social movements with um, academia and with um, popular education, uh, we have a lot to learn from yourselves um, because, unfortunately, we have a very weak base in terms of that interaction um, in South Africa. I would say that um, the University of the Western Cape and the University of KwaZulu-Natal are, are two of the strongest of the disadvantaged universities, University of Zululand also to some extent, um, and University of Venda. But those are all, as I say, historically uh, disadvantaged institutions. And along with that has come huge resource issues because oddly and, and, um, and uh, 
paradoxically, post-apartheid, um, even though the ANC as the struggle party came into government, um, it, the funding basis to these universities stayed the same. So instead of uh, redressing the, the um, uh, amounts of funding, it's only changed recently with a lot of pressure from government. And even now, most of the disadvantaged universities don't have the funding basis and the alumni of the old historically white universities. Um, and I think this has also made, um, you know, it is, it, it's restricted the amount of um, activity that these universities can engage in because we have such high numbers, for example, at University of the Western Cape, teaching on its own is, 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 a, is a massive commitment. And then to still do activist or action-based research on top of that is very difficult. So um, I think I'm going to end on, on that note, but um, I'll be very happy to answer the questions and to say more um, at the end of the session. Thank you. Que bom ouvi-la. Uh, it, it was so nice to hear you, um, Professor Thompson. I'm happy that you were here with us. And it's interesting to see that we have different cultures between our countries, but somehow we have similar problems. I can tell you that we are from the Unified Worker Central. We, we lead a school in Florianópolis. It's the south zone of Brazil. And our capital is considered one of the regions that have the best life quality in Brazil. And during the pandemic, we stopped our work during the pandemics and now we are restarting in a hybrid mode in site and online but as we work with uh, people who are unemployed or they have lo um, low income when we started the subscription process and we checked how many students we had in the group and what type of access they have to the internet. We realized our work was not feasible because most of them didn't have access to computers or internet connection. So popular education and new um, technologies should be taken into consideration. And as you said, it's not easy to understand this moment we are living. We need more investigation and research. And as well, we need to develop new strategies to deal with the public we are targeting. I thank you so much, Professor Thompson. And now we'd like to invite Regina Marteletto. I think I pronounced her name correctly, haven't I? Regina Marteleto is professor in the postgraduate course in information science for the Brazilian Institute of Technology and Information Sciences at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Welcome, Regina. I'll hand over to you. Uh, that's me who has to thank you for this uh, moment. It's a pleasure to be here with my colleagues and with this team. And this is important to, um, event because we have international speakers speaking up from their realities about such special topic. And today we have a topic that is new languages and technologies and popular education. I am part of the Institute of Information, sorry, Institute of 
education and technology and I'm acting in a postgraduate course that it has a um, collaboration with the Univers um, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Although I'm participating in an area that works with information technology, I'm uh, somehow new in this new because I do more with culture issues. Um, when when we talk about health, I'm more present in that field. And today I'm going to talk exactly about the work health workers action during the pandemic and we know that their work is very hard because they don't have access to right resources but we know how important their work are i'll start saying that i reflect from i reflect from the informational field with a focus on interfaces between science and society. And what I intend to study is the creation of hybrid networks of academic and non-academic actor on inter inter interpretative communities. And according to Boaventura Santos, those communities they are community that should be uh, of the interest of the universities. And I'd like to focus on the mediation of knowledge that um, are transmitted socially. And then uh, having said that, I also have um, research I want to present and I want to say that I'm very involved in those fields. And I'm interested in issues involve health and culture. And from the perspective of um, health and So I'm going to be talking about community health agents in their fields of action, thinking about the basic attention to health. So how did I went about this work? So I researched, um, I did also an observation of the practice and listening to the narratives of these agents. I'm not saying that these agents, health agents, have a place of mediation. It's the state that says that when they are orientated through the health system, they are oriented that they are educators and mediators of knowledge. When we think that they live in the community that they act because that's an obligation from the state they need to live in the community that they work and they make the bridge between families and community and the state and the health system so it's a very important role to be the mediator of knowledge so i wanted to know the history from this mediation and we also uh, had a research that happened simultaneously that was a historical documentary research and we researched the genealogy of devices of info communication and health to understand what really is new in the new media and that offers uh, an abundance of information and access and I wanted to see this through the context of digital culture. So I wanted to make a timeline, how these devices change. Do these digital media 
create a new culture, a digital culture. So it's very interesting, it's very important to make this genealogy so that we can understand the new devices that we are dealing with nowadays, because there seems to be an illusion of transparency in these devices because they promote information, they promote access, but how do they work? What are the layers of mediation that are happening inside them? And this is another dimension of my research that I take. And we also did a research of health almanacs here in Brazil. And almanacs used to be very popular and very disseminated in the early uh, years of the 20th century because they were a source of information for health in rural societies and the rural communities in Brazil. And another level was an experimental research that was made through field research. And we were doing that through the health info communicative devices. So we built our own devices for communication and health that we shared with the health agents. So we produced amnocs that were pertaining to dengue fever, to other diseases, including the Zika virus as well. So amnocs were popular uh, devices because even back then they were already very visual and even entertaining. And that's very popular in the language of very different communities. And I have a few initial uh, issues. When we are talking about the epistemological way of this research, it pertains to the individual's capacity of making choices. So an individual can only make a choice with the information that they are given and that the state or the agent gives them. So. And also, let me remind my colleagues, if you think about the dominant ways of knowledge, we had the start of rules of conduct for people to around a technical knowledge to control patients. So we need to think about how health professionals and technicians, they absorb technical and scientific knowledge and they then carry them out as rules of conduct for people to orientate themselves about their health problems. And that can be called as the focus on the informed decision because people assume that I can make a decision with the information that I give, I am given and my quality of life. So if we think about this vision in health, we need to think about a very social anthropological approach for information and health as collective constructions, especially in moments of sanitary crisis, like we see in the current pandemic. We need to understand communication and health as something that is directed to the society. So we work through these lenses and we need to have this critical review of the knowledge in health. So this critic review that how this information is offered to the society is a unidirectional way, but also in the ways of production and the means of production of knowledge inside the academic field. 
And I also have, I, I want to talk about a few things from our research and the ways that we are building things and how we dialogue. So there is Jamie Brell. He is a PD epidemiologist and research from the Ecuador and he is very red here in Brazil and he says that the role of an em emancipated is to assimilate all the knowledge from every form of knowledge so the academic knowledge the popular knowledge and we need to extract all these sources of knowledge, what is necessary to build objects, concepts, and counter hegemonic actions. And he also adds as an important thing that is an effort to discern what are the cultural elements that bind us to ourselves as let's say Latin American people that are dominated, that have a past, colonial past. And I'm also going to cite Paulo Freire. One thing that we want to remind ourselves that Paulo Freire talked about the practice of constructing knowledges and he talks about uh, in his works on the oppressed, he talks about we need to rise up together and awaken ourselves together. And we need to have this epistemological will of knowledge. So we need to associate power, epistemological power to knowledge and whatever source that may come from. And I also want to talk about, I um, was seeing the last session from this event, and I was hearing from Professor Jose Ivo Pedroza. He is uh, an indigenous person, and he started his uh, talk in his indigenous language, he is a professor in a university in Venezuela, and he talked about a cellular memory. And uh, I'm sorry, the name of the professor was Jose Angel Quintero. So he talks about cellular memory that is able to create links and new connections and new comprehensions in the cultural realm. And when I think about culture, I think about policies and politics because there is no culture that there is no movement that can't reach politics as strong as culture. It is a great challenge for refugees, for example, that are around the world should not insert themselves enough through culture. So I also read, uh, I was also part of a collection uh, from a book and a colleague of mine that was a part of this book, he talks about, and he asked this question, how can knowledge and a knowledge that is specific that demands a high technological investigation and a density can reach people's lives. So in other words, by which process can scientific information be produced by research in a biological dimension and reach a political and sy symbolic dimension that govern the daily lives of individuals that find themselves excluded and away or far away from an epistemic world. So we now, uh, I'm now going into our field of research with our work with our community health agents and in this difficult role that is a functioning role that is also practical and lasting with the agents 
having a role of mediators of knowledge in the work with health in the basic attention to health work. So there were a few, let me tell a little bit about their work. They work with the basic attention to health model and they work with prevention of health, trying to reach people before their spontaneous demand. And that is the strategy of family health. And an innovation of their role is their work as a mediator inside the community and being a part of the community. And that is an innovation in their role because they are part of the community and also health agents. And we also talk about the social demands of the community together with the technical aspects that are required for their job. So they have technical learning, but they are also living with social demands and they sometimes clash in their daily work. So there is also the potential of action and there are many potentials. One could be the mediation of distinct knowledge and cultures, and that could point to the, let's say, meeting between health agents and people with needs. So when we have an agent, a health agent that is living and hearing stories and accounts and situations that are not just specific to health issues. They also are close to other social struggles in their own community. So that we can talk about poverty and hunger and maybe addiction to drugs. So that's very complex and also the capacity that they could have to be a bridge for the availability of resources in health as well. And also pointing to the most urgent and necessary revisions in relation to hierarchical forms of production and the valuing and circulation of knowledges in health. So we had as research questions, those practice of uh, health workers that work as mediators, work with uh, family health programs. And this was the research of the question. So how the resources, pedagogic, uh, political, they were useful to guide the population on the ground. And how social network, how social network as a concept that is useful to study the interaction between different actors. And it was important to know how those interactions were important. And so it was important to know how knowledge was built among social wor um, health workers and the community and how the normative principles in health, institutional, social and community, they were important to thinking of the practice that involve pedagogy, life conditions, and as well as different sanitation and social economic issues. Now I will talk a little bit about the results and because we have applied our research results in cities as Rio, Fortaleza, and other cities. So what was the first competence 
that we worked with. And it's very important to think of informational competences and to think how those um, competences help us in the, on the internet. Here we have that the that the health workers they don't work, count only with the information they have on the internet. And when we have our friend, for example, in South Africa, and she talked about the access of their students to internet connection, we have a similar situation here because not all everybody can have access to them. So the first competence is to know the territory where the health agent works on. And this competence is very important because it can enhance the operational capacity of the local health system. So the knowledge about the territory is very important to organize um, the uh, health services and facilities because in the fields they work they are important actors and they should know the territory and another competence is that they are able to recognize different different multiple knowledge so recognize popular knowledge in the strengthening of ties, bonds, and territorial identity in the confrontations of problems and the research for meeting local needs. And those places where we applied our research, we see that um, many people, they are unemployed, they don't have access to basic services. So they use different strategies for survival. And so health workers, they have an important role there. And uh, quoting one of the health workers we have, we end up absorbing many things. We create bonds that sometimes users can't create directly with the nurse, with the doctors. And I think it's important because we are the bridge, we are the, we have important work. And thinking about how important it is, what elements are important for them to develop the work. We have that they need to have uh, knowledge, but also it's important that they have uh, knowledge that goes beyond the knowledge of other professional professionals because they are in contact direct contact with the the community so here's the, those professionals they are going to gather information knowledge and then they are going to act direct in issues concerning health Another important point is that we need to understand that we also need to understand the context where they act. Another issue is that health workers, they are uh, representing the state. So quoting a health agent, some one of them say, today is the only link, perhaps the only career in public administration that access the work directly in the favela and the slums. So as we have our, the work of a social, of a health worker being deprived from many resources, we have that the techno technical knowledge they have it's also important and 
And those knowledge, knowledge that I expressed in many different ways. For example, they don't have access to training that would be very important for them to develop their activities. And we know how important it is mediation in the perspective of a popular ed education because we should raise awareness of the community about some situations that, that involve health workers. In general, health workers, uh, they use traditional um, uh, traditional media such as television, uh, newspaper, radio, and they also use uh, use uh, such access digital media. They use, for example, blogs that are specialized. They also use uh, scientific and official sources like the health ministry website, and that's very important for validating information. And now I'm going to leave you with a few final questions and challenges about the mediator's practice of knowledge and information in health by health agents. One challenge is the conception, and I'm almost done, is the conception of health as a scientifically predefined state versus marked practices. Practices are marked by ambiguity and diversities in respect to representations about the living with health. So it's about educating and conformity in health. And also we have a challenge in higher, the hierarchization of knowledges and unidirectional imposition of information as a clarifying response over a health state and not about its social determinations. Let's remember there was um, a sign with the picture of a mosquito so terrifying saying, if you don't vaccinate, Zika will get you. So there is a threatening discourse that is happening nowadays. And we also need to think about a very important aspect that is the weight of the mediation that is uh, put over the health agents over the how precarious their own work conditions and position and how their position is an inferior position inside public service in general and inside the health ministry. And not only we have this conflicting framework, there is also a lot of relationships that are concurrent and they also show a very opaque picture because the community puts a high trust in the information brought by the mediators and by health agents, but we have also the digital media and it's very urgent to revise all this knowledge and all the higher Christ positions that we see. So that's it. If I have a little bit more time, I would like to project um, what I talked about some um, instruments of health communication that we built together with health agents. If we have time, I'll just um, share very quickly, but I'll let Hosani decide. Oh, you're so naughty, Miss Regina. Please, I didn't see any questions 
in the chat so i'll give you a couple more minutes even though you're out of time so you can share your screen okay so i'll try this right now É, esse é o, é so, o, this is our website from our research group that I'm the coordinator of. So we have all the information from our research. It's a university research group. And we interact deeply with the field research group and the researchers from the group. So we have this device of communication and health. So we try to create a sort of a website for uh, NGOs. And here we have the Dengue, Finger, Dengue Fever Almanac that we built on our research project. So here is the Dengue Fever Almanac. So here was the violent Zini that was an almanac about the violence in the Oscar communities or in the favelas. So we have a very visual communication that is aimed for young people. And we had a series of three almanacs. So the first one was about violence and identity and about violence and culture and culture as a way out of a situation of violence. And the the last one was about violence and networks and territories. So we also built an almanac for the community health agents together with agents themselves. And we used this logic of conversation and dialogue and story building that almanacs that were popular and historically uh, popular here in Brazil always had. And we also invest in games. And this is a game about the work of a community health agent and their challenges of being in a health uh, station or with inside the community. And we also built one last almanac that would be a continuation of the dengue fever almanac, but it's not up yet on our website. So that is it. This is what I wanted to present. And I'm available for any questions or comments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Regina, for your contribution. We now had this topic more connected to health and how it is related to the life, quality of people, and to social movement and pedagogical practices that complement each other and both participant speakers, they had um, presentations that complement themselves. I'd like to talk to Gabriel and Isa that are working with the monitoring of this event. And I'd like you to open your mic and please read the questions that were addressed to us today. Gabriel or Isa, would you like to present the comments of the, the comments that were shared with us? And then we go back to um, our speakers to, to respond to the questions. Uh, Hello, I'm um, Gabriel from the State University of Rio, and today I'm working as a monitor 
and I'd like to congratulate the speaker for your delivering of the, your speeches. We have today so many people um, attending this event and talking about Rede Emancipa social movement. I know your work and I participated in one of the courses uh, Leandra Leao also uh, thanked the work of Rede Emancipa Social Movement. And we are, have other international comments about um, digital technologies. And they, in this comment, they are mentioning how the contact with digital media, it's much more much closer to us now and you also have more technological uh, inclusion and we have also other comments such as one of our participants and they she's saying how important it was the use of whatsapp to help her in the access to education and she also had some challenges, but somehow she managed to, how, managed to use them for educational means. And we also have another question from our, our participant. She's asking Regina about what what's the work of uh, health agents concern popular education now we're going back to our speakers and so they can um, share their thoughts with us gabrielle thank you so much and now i can say that Yesterday, we had the celebration of centennial of uh, Paulus Freire birth. And I'm thinking now, if Paulo Freire was present in this event today, what would be the question he would like to raise? What would be the lesson he would bring to us today in this debate? It's important to mention back then when Paulo Freire was among us, at that time, we didn't have digital media. We didn't have uh, the possibility of having, of having a presentation like this using Zoom. But at that time, Paulo Freire used to what was possible. He used tools that was not were not available he used tools that were available then. He also used tools that engaged people in visual learning. And today, I'm thinking, what would be the lessons we could um, think of uh, Paulo Freire's perspective? And I would like to know from you, um, what do you think Paulo Freire would have to say about the works you are developing uh, concerning new technologies, languages, and the emancipation of our citizens through popular education? We have five minutes to each of us, so please. Thank you so much, Rosani. I enjoyed um, seeing the reality of South Africa with Professor Thompson's presentation and also with the work of Mateleto and to know about the health workers' reality and connecting my work with Mateleto. We have that our work somehow is connected to Martelletto's work because the social, uh, health workers, they 
have a work that engage many other areas and I was very impressed to know more about the work of health workers because at two universities we are somehow connected to our um, national health service and it's important that we resume our capacity of um, keep interaction with a public cell service that these days become very um, a very important issue to think and question because our national health service is very comprehensive and something else that I want to share insight with you is that Rosane, she posted a um, comment that I didn't um, comment on my speech, but when we collected data from the students who, were sub who subscribed to our activities, we realized that it was an interesting change in the profile of those ones who were attending our classes. So before the pandemic times, we, we, we were working with uh, young women from low-income communities. We, don't, we didn't have many um, male working with us. And I'd like to say that our program in, involves lots of um, work with black women, young black women. So somehow we are a black movement. And during the pandemic, we had a change because, because during the pandemic, we realized that those who are attending our classes, we had people who are a bit older, but it's still female. So we, sh we would say that um, we were no longer working with the youth, but with, with those ones who were more, had more education. So somehow because of the pandemic, the connection with the young uh, public was broken. So we got a higher connection with teachers. So because teachers, they have more access to the internet connection. So as you can see, we are also working, we are both working with students and teachers, different groups that are somehow connected. And I'd like to say that it's very important that we develop political awareness. We don't intend to only work with a political knowledge to, um, to just to ask our students to reproduce what we want them to reproduce. We have a vision that we want to learn with our students. We want to learn with their experience. And that's something that Paulo Frey's philosophy is about. We had to go to the ground. We need to know more about um, what's going on on the, on, the, in the, on the territory of the people we work with. So, Somehow, we have a way of working with people if we are mediators, if we, we are open to know what are their interests. Because somehow we lose our students when we don't listen to them, when we don't want to know what are their reality about. 
and it's always the same movement. What is the meeting that we need to provide and what is the discussion that needs to happen ideologically so that movements can be transformational and one last comment is that we also realize that in our classes we received a lot of university professors people from the community and workers and that was an expression of the anguish inside public universities of being available and knowing that these spaces are not well developed and we sometimes fall into the trap of talking about university with the people that are just inside the university so it was very interesting to see how people were coming near us, professors, academics with years in the research field, and they are asking the same questions about popular education as us. And for us in the popular education, we need to know the value of academic research because popular education doesn't um, puts themselves in the place of academic knowledge, but it is also a type of knowledge. So we need to have a meeting and also have both popular knowledge and academic knowledge come together. And we need that to happen so that we as a collective can go forward. And I think we have a lot to learn with those who are who have different struggles so let's say with people with social in the social apartheid movements and we also are taking part in a very new movement that is coming together with african countries now the uh, emancipa movement is also joining forces in angola and all other countries that speak Portuguese because then we don't have a language barrier and the language barrier sometimes is a limitation and now we have a public organization that can help us that is Unilabi and we have this uh, international university with Portuguese speaking people and they always uh, gather international Portuguese speaking students. So we're working together with Unilabi to strengthen our organization and having education that can go through borders. So thank you, Daniela. I'm here in this role of the person that needs to cut the discourses because the clock never stops. And without further ado, we have a question for Lisa that was made in, that will be made in English. So the question is in Portuguese, but I will be speaking in English, but my English is a little bit poor, poor so I'll be speaking uh, paused. So Maria Leticia's question is, what are the mo social movements that are relate that have a relationship with South African universities? The question is which which social movements are related to universities in South Africa? Obrigada, Gabriel. Lisa, thank you, Gabriel. Lisa, welcome again. You can also contribute and you can also give your final remarks in this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, the linkages between social movements and, and South African universities are generally quite weak, um, as I, I've said in my original presentation, although there are academics who uh, I think like, um, for example, 
um, Carlos, who we had a discussion yesterday in preparation for this uh, meeting, who uh, are much more committed to outreach. Um, for example, um, my colleague who's now moving from UWC to University of Johannesburg, Patrick Bond, does a lot of work with the trade unions. Um, and um, I, uh, my, my university works uh, also a lot with, with um, small social movements, um, many of them related to the environment. Um, one of the, the most, most uh, active organizations or institutes on campus is, the, is called PLAS, which works on land and agri agrarian reform. They work a lot with activist groups. But our groups tend to be, I think, from what I understand, and I don't know these social movements uh, seen too much uh, in, in Brazil, although I've been to Brazil many times, and I understand your social movement uh, configuration is very complex, so <laughs> I'm not going to, to comment or try to compare, but I think on the whole, your social movements tend to be larger, uh, tend to be um, more integrated, whereas ours are very... Um, much more working in in silos uh, in 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 small issue areas or or single issue areas should I say rather than than small, um, but there definitely is that interface and uh, between the unions and between um, particularly institutions university institutions like my own UWC there's quite a lot of uh, engagement. And then also with environmental groups, there's a, a fair amount of engagement, um, particularly again from the disadvantaged institutions who tend to have more of an activist outreach. But I, I do, I have found, thank you very much for today's session. I found uh, the, the presentations and the comments um, very, very uh, informative from the way that um, your interface between um, academic institutions and social movements works and seems to be much more robust than ours. And certainly I think there, there can be lessons learned for South Africa and for South, Africa in, South African institutions from the Brazilian experience, especially now. I mean, what makes it even more commendable is that you're working in a situation where that kind of engagement is discouraged, I'm sure, as much as possible. So every little step you, you're making, I'm sure, is, 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 is uh, um, both dangerous in some senses and also um, extremely difficult. And then you've got COVID thrown into the mix as well, which makes it even harder. Um, from our point of view, I think uh, the engagement with the more uh, loosely uh, uh, bound, binded coalitions and social movements is the most uh, difficult during COVID because of their lack of access to, uh, to uh, social media platforms. One of the ones we use the most actually is, is, is WhatsApp because most people do have cell phones and WhatsApp is the cheapest way of, of interacting where you use the least amount of data. So WhatsApp has become very important in, in also reaching out and empowering not just uh, social movements, but also our students. I, um, I find that our student engagement with um, disadvantaged um, groups, which is most of our campus, um, is greatly facilitated and enhanced by WhatsApp. Um, in teaching, I found also that um, the students tend to be more comfortable on WhatsApp as a social media platform than they are on like Zoom or Google Meets when they tend to, again, the whole hierarchy of the, you know, the university lecturer or professor presenting becomes a little bit daunting for them and they're very um, unwilling to 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 divulge uh, or to put themselves in the spotlight for fear, I suppose. It's almost like being on, on TV, isn't it? Um, that you then have that moment where you've got to speak and you're online. So it's, it's different to what it is in the classroom. And I certainly have experienced that in my teaching. So we do a lot of WhatsApping. And I find actually my students tend to be much more forthcoming on WhatsApp than they are on the social media platforms. So again, I think just going over the whole terrain of both the integration 
uh, of academia into social movements and also in terms of um, the pedagogy of, of using all these platforms uh, to, uh, to educate and to capacitate something that we, we keep on having to revisit and to, to learn. I mean, we're only, we're hoping that at some point we are going to be able to go back to a face-to-face environment. But at this stage, that looks like it could be uh, some time before we would be back there. And that has uh, knock-on consequences for the debate that and discussion that we've been having today. So I'll stop there and say thank you so much for inviting me. And I've so enjoyed um, being part of this panel. Obrigada, Lisa. Regina, rapidamente. Thank you so much, Elisa. So now we have Regina. The last but the not least important. Um, well, answering um, the, your question about the influence or inspiration that we would have about from Paulo Freire pedagogy. And thinking about the question that was raised on our chat about what lessons can be absorbed from um, the work we develop. Well, in the 60s, I watched a seminar from Paul Freire um, at the university in Campinas in Sao Paulo. And he was explaining how the objects around him, even elements of the nature, how all elements and of nature were contributing to, for him to develop his philosophical and pedagogical work. So this type of um, work that Paulo Freire uh, left to us, uh, his legacy was exactly this. And Paulo Freire um, taught us how grounding the knowledge, it is important. Because when we mention health workers, they know their community, they have real life knowledge, knowledge about the world, the context where they live. So answering the question, I would say that experience is very important. Knowledge is very important. And Paulo Freire, Freire left us this legacy and this philosophy is very important and as well it's important to um to value social movements and how people understand the value of those social actors that are involved in health service and how they struggle to um, enhance the service and the quality of the service we have access to. So to know how important those actors are in our for our lives, I think this is um, another insight. So, we have that also Paulo Freire has experiences of work in Africa. And for me, this is the final reflection. I think we need to ponder on the practice we carried, carry out in the, in the, we need to find a way to build what we could call the third knowledge. And I wouldn't say that it's not, a, there is not a single answer, but always all paths that we find to acquire knowledge and to struggle for our rights, all the, those paths are important somehow. And they represent different experience that enrich our knowledge and our struggle. And so 
we should go uh, we should uh, follow the third knowledge and practice is very important to have in consideration Paulo's Freire legacy uh, that's so beautiful to hear you Regina thank you very much each of you have been participating today I'd like to thank our interpreters our monitoring team and the moderators we had today and I'd like to say that for me who has been working and the Unified Worker Central and understand how important the social movement is when it's connected to the university's work and take into consideration what Regina has just said. It is very, very brilliant what she said because knowledge and practice that what transform the reality and talk from the standpoint of somebody who is from the Unified Work Central. Central, I'd like to know that we have big challenges, but we should um, continue. Now we are going to have a follow-up with uh, um, other activities that will permit exchanges here in this event such as workshops so if you want to participate in those workshops just continue continue uh, you'll be welcome and for the next week so we also have other activities and i hope we are with us i hope you have a good day thank you for attending Recording stopped. Rapaziada, não queria sair sem deixar um agradecimento aí pela oportunidade, pela mesa, pelo contato com todo mundo. Vou agora para outra atividade que aqui é trabalho. Valeu, pessoal. Até... Valeu, gente. Também vou.